Okay, you guys can turn to, um, make sure I'm recording here. You guys can turn to section 11.2 in your PowerPoint, and then that would be on page 375 in your textbook, so you can follow along. Talk about how the heart is regulated and um, how the heart beats and how it gets its rhythm and things like that. So now that we've learned the parts, you guys um, can, we can work on this. So we're going to look at three things, uh, internal control, external control, and then the conduction system itself. So first thing on our list is the sinoatrial node, and you'll hear this, you might write this out as the SA node or the pacemaker. So this is really um, the, when we, when we talk about nodes, it's like a little kind of a bundle or a nodule almost of nervous tissue. And so that's what we, when we say node, it's just think of like a round kind of, um, think of a, uh, like a round, um, uh, just a little ball of nervous tissue. Okay, but these nodes are kind of like pinpointed places in the heart that send signals. <coughs> so the SA node is really what sets the pace of the heart. And if you go on and look at, let's see, okay, this picture right here, the SA node is right here in the right atrium, very top of the right atrium. That's the pacemaker. Okay, so that is your... Um, that's what really sets the pace of the heart rate itself. That's where the electrical impulse begins. Sinoatrial or SA. Okay, external control of the heart. Well, the SA note is the primary internal control. That's where it begins. So external control of the heart has to do um, with your nervous system. Kind of results from that. So look, the cardiac center, this is where the sympathetic nervous system speeds it up. Remember we talked about fight or flight or sympathetic versus um, parasympathetic. Sympathetic is your, that's your stress, your high stress, right? Your fight or flight, you're working out or something scares you, whatever it is. <clears throat> it makes your heart rate go up. So that's an external control. Parasympathetic nervous system tends to slow it back down, kind of puts you in a state of rest. So, um, but these, these uh, nervous systems are constantly making adjustments in the heart rate, in the strength of, the, of your heart's contraction, so how strong it contracts. And then stroke volume is the other one. And remember, stroke volume is just how much blood is pumped out of the heart and went with that one stroke. So those are constant, it's just, remember we talked about homeostasis, and it's just a constant balance of your body getting the oxygen, the blood, um, or the oxygen via the blood, the way that it needs to. Uh, baroreceptors um, is something else to look up. So baroreceptors, B-A-R-O-R-E-C-E-P-T-O-R-S. These are actually pressure receptors, kind of like nervous cells that sense pressure, kind of like, um, like pressure in your skin, your integumentary system, you know, in your skin. So sensitive to pressure, these are located in the atrium and the aortic arch, so the, the very the part of the aorta that kind of curves around. Uh, the carotid arteries, so the, the big arteries in your neck where you can feel your pulse. And these also help monitor blood pressure. So these are kind of like stretch receptors or pressure receptors located in these areas that help you respond by your heart rate changing or changing the size of your blood vessels, et cetera. So those are other things that send messages to the brain that tells um, your heart if it needs to be more, if it needs to be less, if it needs to be stronger, or doesn't need to be so strong. Those are other things that, that play into that. Um, so again, parasympathetic nervous system is dominant while you're resting, releases acetylcholine, which decreases your heart rate, and then the sympathetic nervous system is what kicks in whenever we, we're doing exercise or we're under any kind of stress. All right, the endocrine system, we know that's your chemical messenger system, right? That's your hormones. And so some hormones cause the heart to speed up, right? 
So we know that the adrenal medulla, and that's the central part of the adrenal gland, secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these are also related to the sympathetic nervous system. So these increase the heart rate. Um, thyroid is another example. It releases thyroxine, which also increases the heart rate, right? That increases metabolism. So those are um, just some other things that really control the way that the heart works. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the conduction system itself. Um, the conduction system itself. So this is the, the message, or let's see, this is kind of the direction in which the electrical impulse flows through the heart that makes it beat the way that it's supposed to. So here's the primary anatomy of the conduction system. The SA node is right up here, right in the upper right atrium. <coughs> Excuse me. The AV node, okay, is located, look, it's atrioventricular node. So it's located between the atria and the ventricles, right? It makes sense between those two. So in the pathway, this, these are all listed in the pathway. Now we're talking about, we're not talking about the pathway of the blood, okay, like we just took the quiz over. We're talking about the pathway of the electrical impulse that makes the heart beat. So it starts in the SA node, travels, these are called internodal pathways. And then you get down here to the AV node, so another little bundle of tissue here. And then you have a very large bundle of nervous tissue that extends down towards uh, uh, towards the septum. There we go. So this is called the bundle of his. So next, that's a large bundle that goes from this AV node down to the septum. And the septum is what separates the right and left sides of the heart. Okay. So um, you've got then it splits into a right and left side. So you've got your right bundle branch and your left bundle branch. And then these bundle branches, bundle branches kind of swing out back around the outside of the heart. And so you think about the way the heart beats. First thing that beats, first thing that, that happens, okay, is the atria contract, right? So these are squished in, squished in that way. And then it just keeps traveling. And then it, the ventricles, I mean, it's just like a, it just, Constantly, the atria, then the ventricles, atria, ventricles. And these come out and these eventually end in the Purkin G fibers, which makes all these muscles contract. And that's what these, that's what um, these, this nervous tissue is doing. It's just telling that muscle to contract. But that's the order that it goes in. So every heartbeat, that's what's happening. You got this whole little progression of this electrical pathway. <coughs> Excuse me, now let's look at some electrocardiograms. <clears throat> I think you'll find some of this really interesting. Okay, um, normal heart rate or normal pulse is 60, anywhere from 60 to 100. And um, a normal EKG, well, let me say that again. EKG stands for electrocardiogram, so literally a, a record of the electricity that's running through the heart. Just gives you a picture of what that electricity looks like on paper. And that's what it's measuring. How well is, is that conducting zone working? Is it, is it, is your heart beating the way that it's supposed to in the order that it's supposed to? So depolarization is when the heart, and when specifically the ventricles contract um, well, whenever we say the heart contracts the ventricles, but anyways, we'll have depolarization of each. And then repolarization is when it relaxes. Same as when we talked about um, nervous impulses. Remember, we talked about depolarization and repolarization. So depolarization is when it contracts. Repolarization is when it relaxes. <clears throat> so when you look at an EKG, you guys have seen EKGs before. Right, you see them, they look like this. This is a normal sinus rhythm. They'll be on a little strip. Kind of like this. So let me show you 
what they're, this is an up close version of that. And this is what you're really looking for. So this, from this little section here until here, I'll say that. It's measured, let me read, let me. <coughs> I want to look at one thing before I, I may not list it in here, but anyway. Okay, I'm not seeing what I'm looking for, but anyway, it's okay. So you're looking at basically everything that happens in one heartbeat is in this, found in this little um, section of the EKG. So this, this first little wave on the um, graph, is called the P wave, and these go in order. Look, P, Q, R, S, T. Really simple, that part is. So P wave, this is when the atria depolar, so when the atria contract, and that's always gonna start it, because that's, that's where the SA node starts, so that's what starts it first. So you have this little P wave, here we go. Then you have this, is called the QRS complex, and it dips down a little bit, it goes way up, right, because that is when the ventricles depolarize, so that's like ma massive contraction. Remember, the ventricles are much larger than the atria. And then it goes back down, QRS. So this is when the ventricles are depolarizing, so when they're contracting. And then over here is the T wave is when the ventricles repolarize, so they're resting again. And then it just starts all over, okay? It just starts all over. Now, the atria repolarize while the ventricles are depolarizing. So basically the, the atria relax while the ventricles are contracting. And, but what happens is on this, on the EKG, because there's so much activity going on when the ventricles contract, that that repolarization doesn't actually show up on the EKG. And that's because there's just a lot of activity going on at the ventricles, so it kind of like overruns it, if you will. <clears throat> so that's what you're really looking at. So let's look at, so you can see that here, right? You got your P wave, QRS complex, and then your T wave. P wave, QRS, T wave. And these little boxes are all a measurement of time. And it's been a long time since I looked at an EKG, but um, I'm not seeing that on here. Anyway, so this is that's how you measure though. Each one of these is, is a certain amount of time. Okay, so abnormal contractility condition. Um, is an arrhythmia, or it's without rhythm, right? It's not contracting in its normal rate. It doesn't have that pretty P, Q, R, S, T going on. Now, we'll say this, atrial arrhythmias are usually not as serious as ventricular um, arrhythmias. So if the atria are not contracting exactly normal, that's usually, um, it's something that can be resolved long-term or something that you might get put on medication for for a long time and expect it to get better over time. Ventricular arrhythmias are a different story because you think those are, when blood leaves the right side, the right ventricle, it heads to the lungs. Well, we know we have to have oxygen. And when it leaves the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, it goes to the rest of the body, including the brain and everywhere else that needs it. So it's a big deal when the, vent when the ventricles have an arrhythmia. <clears throat> now, any of it is a big deal. You don't want any arrhythmia, but ventricular ones are significantly, um, you know, more damaging than atrial ones. So, some causes of arrhythmias, um, heart muscle damage. Your heart has been damaged in some way, either, you know, heart attack or some other kind of injury even. Uh, CAD, which is coronary artery disease, that's where you get all that fatty plaque buildup. Hypertension, 
which is high blood pressure, smoking, excessive alcohol consumption, excessive caffeine, electrolyte imbalance, drug use, stimulant, especially stimulating dietary supplements. You guys, I cannot tell you how important it is that you are very careful about what kind of medications that you put in your body. So many of those dietary supplements, and I don't care if a doctor prescribes them for you, you need to do your research on them. Um, and you need to make sure that they're approved because there have been so many instances where those dietary, um, like diet supplements or medicines that, you know, increase your metabolism or whatever are really harmful to your heart. I mean, you see commercials about them all the time. So it's something to, to really watch. Um, stress, medications, anything like that can cause severe weakness. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about some different types of arrhythmias. Um, so bradycardia just means slow heart rate. Brady means slow. So notice this one, see how far apart the beats are? That tells you that it's a bradycardia, okay? We looked at this one, see how they're a little closer together. This one, they're just really far apart. So it's just beating slow. Usually bradycardia is considered less than 60 beats a minute. Some people's, you know, their norm is like 50, and that's okay too, but, you know, less than 50 is a true bradycardia, I would say. Tachycardia means it's really fast. And I always remember this, because if you get dressed too fast, you look tacky, right? So fast heartbeat, notice how close together these are. They still have the normal shape, okay, but they're really close together. This is usually what I wrote down from the book was that it's greater than 100. Um, um, okay. Premature atrial contractions or PACs. Okay, this means that the atria contracts before the SA node. So that means your atria are kind of doing their own thing, right? They're not waiting for the SA node to tell them to contract. They're just doing their own and getting things started. So look, you can see they're not necessarily on every beat, but look, see how you got this normal kind of rhythm going on, and then all of a sudden you got bump, 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 bump. Okay, that's kind of what it would sound like. So it's just contracting too early. All right, atrial fibrillation. This is where the atria actually, instead of like contracting, like pumping like they need to, they just kind of quiver in place, right? It's like they're having a spasm or something. The atria, not the ventricles, but the atria. And they actually will contract faster than 350 beats per minute. So it's just the atria are doing that. Now, you can live in atrial fibrillation. It shouldn't stay there for very long. Most people who've had this have take some kind of regular medication for it, and then they have extra medication they can take if they feel that their heart has gone into AFib. Sometimes you'll hear it called AFib. <coughs> and so they'll have special medicine that they take when they feel their heart, and you can feel it. it's like a flutter or like a, I mean, it's just like, would kind of make you uncomfortable, maybe have a lot of, uh, just your heart's beating super fast. So this is what that one looks like. And it, look, it's just like, you can still see the QRS because the ventricles are still beating, but look in between, the atria are just kind of like going crazy in between all those. This is the most common arrhythmia there is, is atrial fib. All right, premature ventricular contractions. So these are called PVCs, and it's where the ventricles contract too soon. So they're not waiting on those nodes to tell them to contract there. Again, they're just doing their own thing. Okay, and you can see here where these just kind of get like squished in there together. So you got this regular beat, and then all of a sudden, 
you got another one that's come up really quickly. And it's just not waiting its turn. <clears throat> you see what else it says? It says this is a condition which Perkins fibers fire before the SA node. Um, says single PVCs are not dangerous, but if you get them frequently, like more than six per minute, um, it could be dangerous. So it, again, ventricular arrhythmias are much more dangerous, generally speaking, than atrial ones. Doesn't mean that atrial ones aren't serious. It means that ventricular ones are very, very serious. Uh, ventricular tachycardia. So this is where the ventricles are actually beating too fast. Um, the ventricles themselves are just going way too fast. And look, you can't even tell really on here where the, uh, the atria are trying to beat. Like you can't even see it. This is what a VTAC looks like. Um, and they're just kind of like leading the way. So definitely needs intervention very quickly. They usually can give medication or they might can do a version where they like will use, um, well, a lot of times they can do medication with the version or they might actually have to shock it back into place. <coughs> says, and this, the heart rate is between 150 and 250 beats per minute. All right, ventricular fibrillation. This is where the ventricles actually beat faster than 350 beats per minute. And I want you to look at this, at, um, this electrocardiogram. There's like no rhythm to it whatsoever. It's just a squiggly line. Okay, that's not a good sign. This is not compatible with life. So you cannot live in ventricular fibrillation for more than a couple minutes. This is what, whenever we talk about um, using like an AED, an automatic external defibrillator, this is what that's for. So when an automatic one, it's already set to the right amount of electricity and you put it on someone and it shocks them and tries to get this type of rhythm into a normal rhythm. And that works for this. Well, in theory it works. Um, I'm not going to say it works every time, but that's what it's for. It's for ventricular fibrillation. Again, not compatible with life. Heart block. So says this is impulse from the SA node to the AV node gets blocked. A okay, heart block. It just means that it's delayed or it could be blocked sometimes or it could be blocked altogether. Um, and so the AV node usually does that blocking. So it's just not, the message isn't getting through. Uh, first degree heart block, this is delayed. So that means that the, the message from the SA node to the AV node is getting delayed. It's just taking a really long time to get there. Second means that it, every now and then it's blocked. And then third means that it's completely blocked. It's very dangerous because the atria and the ventricles are not connected. It's like they're each doing their own thing. So the atria are going off when they want to, and the ventricles are going off when they want to. So again, it's very, um, very dangerous. And AED, like we just talked about, um, you guys have all learned how to use one of these. It's automatically uh, fixed so that it has the, the right amount of, I'm gonna say the right amount. It has a kind of a generic amount of electricity in it. Um, now at the hospital, they probably have a specific amount. They might they can set their own joules of electricity in it, shock someone. But these are automated, um, and it, it's trying to get the heart to start into a normal, back into a normal rhythm. Anybody can use one, and just like you guys have learned, you know, you just once you open it up, it tells you exactly what to do. All you have to do is look at the little pads on there and put those in the right places and listen to the prompts from the AED. They'll tell you what to do. Um, just make sure you clear and nobody's touching them when you hit the shock button. Okay. And that's it. So that's 11.2. Um, if you guys have any questions, I would encourage you, if this is something that really interests you, look up some um, EKGs online. So. Um, you know, these are some things to really look at. Oh, I wrote down a couple more notes on third degree heart block. Um, I put that it was dangerous because of no communication. 
atria contract with the SA node, but the ventricles do their own thing, which I said. But let me say this, the ventricles contract much slower than the atria do. So you've got your, so you got your P wave, and then your QRST here, P, QRST, then your P wave is here, and your ventricles way back here. So that's what's happening, okay? Um, and most of the time, people who have third degree heart block are gonna have to have a pacemaker. They're gonna have to have something that tells their whole heart when to beat, okay? So that's, um, that's that. I'll let you guys be.